All right, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to our joint Cornell Columbia Grand Rounds. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Manish Aghi, Professor of Neurosurgery at UCSF. Uh, Dr. Aghi started his education at Stanford, where he received a BS in biology, after which he completed his MD and PhD in neurosciences at Harvard. He then finished his residency in neurosurgery at Mass General, joining the faculty at UCSF thereafter. He's now the principal investigator in the Brain Tumor Research Center, the director for the Center of Minimally Invasive Skull-Based Surgery, and vice chair of neurosurgery at UCSF. As everyone here knows, he's won numerous accolades for his incredible work, both translationally and clinically in research and his overall contributions to neurosurgery, uh, focusing primarily on gliomas and pituitary tumors. He's been a leader nationally, uh, serving as the chair of the joint section on tumors, and really has been an incredible example of how to succeed as a physician scientist in neurosurgery. He's had continuous NIH funding since he started his career at UCSF, publishing over 200 publications and leading over five clinical trials. So it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Manish Aghi and welcome. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. It's really an honor to be here. I wish I could be there in person with you all, but um, uh, Zoom is certainly the next best thing. I'm going to be talking to you today about um, my experiences at UCSF with endoscopic surgery for cellar and paracellar tumors. Some lessons learned, not just in the operating room, but in the laboratory, because as was mentioned, I'm a surgeon scientist and uh, wear a few hats in that regard. Um, uh, one quick disclosure, which won't be relevant, is just a skull-based course that I direct for residents. Um, so I've broken this talk into three components or three parts. I'll start by talking about the wear my surgeon's hat and talk about sort of the, the surgical things, but certainly many of you know what, what I will be covering there. Um, and then I'll transition to a second part, which is wearing an endocrinologist hat and talking a little bit about the endocrine morbidities of what we do around the pituitary gland. And then for the last part, I'll, I'll wear the scientist hat and talk a little bit about more recent work in, in my laboratory, trying to define pituitary adenoma biology. And um, I'll try and cater this a little bit to the residents in particular. Um, I know for Grand Rounds, it's, it's such an important part of resident education. So I'll really try and sort of explain how I got to some of these points. And um, because really wasn't that long ago that I was in the shoes of many of you finishing residency and starting my practice. And I think it's always important for speakers to give that perspective of where they, how they got to where they're at and not just present it as a completed body of work. Um, so starting with expanded endoscopic approaches, um, we've all seen this anatomy uh, numerous times from folks like Ted and others, but um, I, I am always uh, amazed by it every time I look at it. And it's really one of the things that's drawn me to this field. Um, but as we, um, you know, think about when I first started thinking about endoscopic skull base surgery, I was always drawn to the optical carotid recesses as sort of key landmarks anatomically, both the medial OCR, Select and, a header, it'll... which is sort of the, uh, the ventral surface, the medial anterior clinoid, and then out laterally, the lateral OCR, which is sort of molded by that pneumatization of the optic strut of the anterior clinoid. And of course, that's what gives us the exposure for the expanded approaches. You can see the we take the bone off the pituitary gland, but it's really when we remove the bone over the superior intercavernous sinus that we are able to access the supercellar cistern. And then when we remove the medial OCR, we get access to the carotid canal and optic canal, which is sort of analogous to a keyhole during a uh, terional craniotomy. Um, so jumping right into sort of cases, I will say when I first started my practice, and to some degree, this, the, this has never really changed. It, when you see sort of pituitary tumors, you find your clinic sort of overwhelmed with these cysts that, uh, and I found myself thinking about them anatomically a fair bit. Um, so this is an example of a supercellar cyst in a 56 year old female with um, a mass that wasn't necessarily affecting her vision, but had grown over serial imaging uh, when she came to me uh, with about a millimeter of growth per year over four years on annual MRIs. And so, um, you know, we took her to the OR, but in thinking about her pathology, uh, and I'll get to the operation in a second, I found myself thinking early on about sort of supercellar Rathke's cleft cysts and in training, I had, you know, always thought of Rathke's cleft cysts as 
at least seller or uh, pars intermedia in nature and sort of this classic teaching of how they form from the uh, uh, remnants of the Rathke's pouch that ultimately uh, persist in that pars intermedia. Um, but you know, about 10% of these cysts as, are, are purely supercellular in nature. Um, and we looked at this in a series that we published um, and they, we are, they're felt to evolve from the pars tuberalis, which is this other component of Rathke's pouch that actually extends up the anterior aspect of the infundibulum. Um, and that, that anatomy proves to be key because those supercellular cysts um, will tend to be on one side of the stalk or the other, but they'll have a significant component that'll be anterior to the stalk and, and sort of accessible um, uh, through an endoscopic approach. And so we started doing these cases endoscopically early on and, and found that um, historical controls from our institution before um, I was doing them endoscopically and before I even started, microscopic approaches to supercellular Rathke's clefsis were really ineffective. Uh, we're leaving significant remnants, but with a supercellular approach, we were getting complete resections and, and sort of favorable results in terms of preserving gland function, improving symptoms, because some of these patients do present with sort of symptoms of hypopituitarism or headache or obviously vision loss given the location of the tumor. And, and a recurrence rate that just kept getting lower and lower over time, but uh, to the point where it started to resemble the recurrence rate of cellular microscopic Rathke's, although, and, and none of them really were sort of that, that damning multiply recurrent cellular Rathke that we all see from time to time. At most, it would be one recurrence and, and easily fixable. And so with that in mind, this is the case I showed. Um, and you know, just the approach of drilling out all that bone widely, um, I'll try and uh, to not just expose the cella, but uh, exposing uh, the supercellular space as well, opening the dura over the gland, and then working your way up. So you see the gland in yellow and the cyst above and then developing that plane around the cyst so that you're not just going into it or draining it. Um, I believe these are sort of gross, totally resectable lesions. They're not sort of the principles we use in the cella that Marty Weiss and others have talked about where we um, don't do a complete resection, but try and get some of the lining. This is really getting complete lining. In this case, we release the cyst contents to try to deflate the lining uh, so that we can finish, finish our manipulation and sharp excision of the lining because it's just too big to do that without um, doing that. Although the, some of them can certainly be taken apart without a um, rupture, but in this case, we had to get those contents. They're, they're different than Celerathes. They don't have as much squamous metaplasia and sort of um, some of these other features that predisposed to recurrence. Uh, but eventually once we're, um, we get that, those contents completely out and I, I feel like those, these supercellular Rathkes are like the way my wife packs a suitcase. They just keep delivering and delivering contents, but eventually it's all out. And then you get to the lining and you can work um, your way around that lining, identify the stalk and then the, the surrounding anatomy quite nicely. Cause in the supercellular cistern, you're just gonna be operating in that CSF space. And we can take down that lining sharply and really make sure um, that we're not leaving any um, remnant behind. Um, using, of course, angled endoscopes as well to look around corners until finally you're just left with that sort of normal anatomy posterior to the cyst in the CSF space of the supercellular cistern. Um, and so this is what that looks like postoperatively with a nasal septal flap in place. Um, wanted to shift gears to another supercellular pathology that uh, you know, numerous groups have been doing endoscopically endonasally. And I just wanted to present two cases that I found interesting and, and sort of helped me think about this, uh, particularly in the context of sort of the, the grading schemes that, you know, we've published and, and that uh, Ted has published from your group as well. Um, so this is a 59 year old woman with some progressive left temporal vision loss and a tuberculum cell of meningioma um, just shy of three centimeters in maximal dimension with some radiographic evidence of left canal invasion, abutment of the um, arteries, particularly the, um, the left carotid, but not encasement. Um, not shown here, there was some mild T2 hyperintensity, but nothing avid on CT scan, but some questions about um, uh, suggestions that it might've been soft in nature. And as I alluded to, we all have started an increasing trend towards grading scales, um, those of us uh, who do tuberculum cell and meningioma felt sort of left out with all the other grading scales that were coming into vogue. And there've been some nice ones. So 
Um, Stephen McGill in our group, uh, working with other centers, uh, including your own, uh, looked at this in the context of whether providers in the series were more likely to use um, endonasal versus transcranial approaches based on a score that accounts for proximity to the uh, carotid arteries, uh, optic canal involvement, and then tumor diameter. And then Ted more recently, of course, looked at just purely from an endonasal approach, uh, what's the resectability score in terms of the chances of a, a gross total resection. And these cases actually predate uh, or predate the, the publication of the approaches. But in looking at uh, this particular case, what was interesting to me was on the UCSF scale, it, it scored a 211 um, based on that size being larger than 1.7 centimeters. And at least based on the multiple sites that participated in that, it would suggest that most of them were taking that out transcranially. But in contrast, through the Cornell resectability score, it suggested we had a good chance of a gross total resection. What I found most interesting about this case was just how soft it was. Um, and that was really what was most memorable and, and favorable about it. Um, so again, just cauterizing the dura to get that blood supply taken down uh, and then opening uh, widely. We found early on that the tumor was really just liquidy in nature. So this was able to come out with almost a two section technique or deflecting with ring curette and, um, and just working. Uh, to, it just sort of falls away from the brain. Very, very soft texture, a little bit of hydrodissection with all that CSF. Um, and then, but of really trying to keep it together as much as possible so the tumor doesn't fragment into pieces. Um, the arachnoid um, is preserved uh, in terms of the attachments to the arteries and those can be taken down sharply to uh, deflect the arteries away. Uh, but eventually we were able to work from, from a sort of anterior to posterior approach, superior to inferior, and then turn towards removing the inferior tumor, visualize and preserve the stalk. And then um, once that inferior tumor is removed out, all the central tumor is now out and we can elevate the tumor um, away from the optic chiasm and, and preserve that as, uh, and, and decompress that nicely. And then gently roll that tumor. We know we've got left canal invasion and so that's the last final piece of it. That bone's already been drilled out in, in terms of that hyperostosis. Um, but we've preserved the tumor in sort of one piece, um, I mean, uh, with some central decompression, but that allows us to roll a tumor away and out of the canal um, it, quite nicely because it was so soft. Um, and, it, and that really proved instrumental in getting out uh, this tumor. And then of course, with these cases, very important at the end, particularly with canal invasion, to use that angled endoscope to be able to look around corners. Um, and uh, once you've got that last little piece out of there. So that final peak with the uh, angled endoscope gives you that confirmation of, uh, of resection. Um, and that's that post arbor scan. So this is the opposite scenario. Uh, in terms of texture, which I, was really what I wanted to touch on with these cases. This is a 51-year-old female, again, with um, some uh, vision loss uh, of about two months in duration, smaller tumor, uh, just breaking two centimeters in maximal dimension, no canal involvement and no vascular involvement, um, but um, really dark on T2, which I haven't shown here. Um, a very a favorable score for, uh, the UCSF score suggested this, this score in general was rare. Um, but it was approached equally transcranially and endonasally, and, and then favorable resectability score on the Cornell uh, scoring system. And for this one, I had a sonoped available, um, just given potential firmness, and that proved to be um, very useful. Um, and, and this was something, at least for us, we struggled with early in doing these cases was when they weren't soft and sort of readily uh, dissectable, you know, what do you do? And in this case, as soon as we opened the dura, what we encountered was, was not calcified by any means, but really quite firm. Uh, a suction wasn't gonna do much to it. And so in this case, we worked around it, elevated it off the gland, uh, but ultimately to get out the tumor, we needed the sonopet to debulk it from internally. Uh, and then several portions of it were just excised. So unlike the previous one where we keep it together and roll it out, we're actually um, debulking the, tum the tumor with the sonopet and then also periodically sharply cutting out pieces that are delivering themselves. And then same anatomy comes to play in terms of 
getting it out without canal division, it really comes out as a big piece at the end, but now you've got that normal anatomy. Uh, same thing, important to use the angled endoscopes even if it doesn't go out into the canal. So uh, that was really my sort of brief foray into the tuberculum cella and then wanted to touch on cavernous sinus in, uh, invasion as well. Um, in our hands, the indications for chasing adenomas into the cavernous sinus have been somewhat soft because of the effectiveness of radiosurgery, uh, but certainly it's been useful for trying to achieve biochemical remission for a hypersecreting tumor where there's a mild degree of invasion. And um, it's been useful in other uh, non-functional cases to try to get invasive tumor away from the optic and reduce a target size for radiation and, and potentially enable a tumor that might have needed fractionation to be treated in a single fraction approach. And of course, there's two corridors here, but we always start with the medial corridor, transcellar, transcavernous to get through the area of medial cavernous sinus wall compromise. And then uh, if needed, um, uh, supplement with a lateral transpterygoid approach where you make that separate durotomy uh, lateral to the uh, cavernous carotid. So here's one where it was an acromegalic with an IGF-1 of uh, 1330 tumor encasing the right cavernous carotid. And this was able to be debulked uh, through a purely transcellar transcavernous going through a compromised medial cavernous sign as well. This is older, so I apologize for the lack of high definition, but basically um, as we uh, uh, remove the bone and get into the um, cellar portion of the tumor, we work our way, uh, once the cellar portion is done, we get into the cavernous sinus through that compromised wall, pack off the venous bleeding, but eventually working in that space once the venous bleeding has subsided um, and we're able to get more soft tumor out using the Doppler and direct visualization to see um, uh, the cavernous carotid um, and working around it as well as the, the, the venous bleeding. Um, and, and just working in that narrow corridor, but and seeing that pulsatility and, and preservation um, there. And this postoperatively, we looked at this via CTA um, and uh, as well as an MRI and saw no evidence of residual tumor in a six week favorable oral glucose tolerance test. Here's another one where we were able to supplement with a lateral approach. Um, this patient experienced apoplexy two decades ago. Uh, operated on sublabially, reportedly gross total resection, but did not get serially imaged, represents with fatigue, found to be hypogonadal, and had a large recurrent cystic component in the central cella and invasion into the left cavernous sinus. Um, and so in this case, we um, start out with a very large amount, unlike the previous case, but a, a large amount of cellar tumor, which we debulk um, first. And just like any other cellar adenoma surgery, once you're done, the diaphragma will prolapse downwards and you see the clear arachnoid of the diaphragma without a leak. We see the medial cavernous sinus wall. We're able to see an error of breach, but then we bring in the, um, the Doppler. Um, we, we take the durotomy all the way up to as far as we can based on the Doppler. We've got that breach, but we've maximized at this point what we can get um, through the medial corridor eventually. And so now we've got to come laterally because um, there's more tumor that can be delivered infer through an inferior durotomy working um, lateral to the carotid through that transterogoid approach. Again, use the Doppler before making that cut um, and use the uh, six nerve stimulator as well. Um, uh, and then we bring in that ring curette, confirm that that space lateral to the carotid can be worked in safely uh, and debulk more tumor um, through that corridor and, and maximize the durotomy and deliver more tumor out that way until eventually you've got uh, two cavities with carotid in between them. And so this patient had residual tumor around the carotid. Um, this was a silent corticotrophic adenoma with a MIB one of 4%. A separate topic could be when to use radiation, but in this case, given that it was a recurrence, an SCA and a MIB one above 3%, it seemed uh, like a relative no brainer to move forward with radiosurgery, which thankfully was single fraction in nature. And so we've been fortunate to see improvement in our rates of gross total resection uh, with these cavernous sinus invasion, invasive tumors. And even for the ones with residual, get some reduction in volume such that we're able to shift our practice to be more, much more in favor of single fraction radiosurgery when we need to radiate residual in the cavernous sinus. So I think overall it's been uh, 
a successful endeavor and it's consistent with what Ted and others have published through this meta-analysis of the literature back in uh, 2016. Um, so having touched on the sort of surgical aspects of what we're doing at UCSF, which I hope aligns nicely with what you all are doing, I wanted to shift gears and, and sort of wear an endocrinologist hat and talk about some of the endocrine morbidities of these approaches. I showed you surgery in the cavernous sinus, radio surgery in the cavernous sinus, but you know, we, we as surgeons have to be cognizant of what we're doing to patients hormonally, particularly young patients who have not yet had children and, uh, and, and patients whose quality of life long-term is an important consideration. And I should mention that, you know, it's sort of for the residents out there, this topic um, became of interest to me um, when I first started my practice, I was fortunate to have a medical student reach out to me and say, you know, I want to write some clinical papers with you. And I said, well, that's great, but I literally just started the clinic a few weeks ago as a practicing neurosurgeon. Why don't we start by having you come to my clinic and just sit in on these visits, patients who are having surgery, a few post-ops, and, and take notes. And then afterwards, in particular, take notes about what questions people are asking me. And afterwards, we should sit down and talk because let's write our first few papers about answering these questions so that the next time we get asked these questions, we can say, well, this is the, the exact answer to your question. And so it turned out that the most common question I was being asked during my first um, several dozen clinic encounters with these patients was, how do you know that you're removing the tumor and not the gland? And you know, it, it sort of seemed obvious to me. I mean, I've been taught that texture of tumor versus normal gland, the, the dissection of a gland tumor interface, but patients didn't want to hear that. They really wanted to hear, you know, I'm going to be able to have children in, in a few years. I'm not going to be on steroid replacement in a few years, or what are the odds of that? And so it does get at this issue that, you know, carotid injuries are thankfully sort of almost never events, um, but hypopituitarism represents one of the most common, if you particularly anterior and posterior dysfunction combined, and yet understudied risks of pituitary surgery. And, and so we asked, what does the data tell us about this risk and the things we can do to reduce it? And so we've continued to um, collect data in, in this manner and have been fortunate to have about 12 years of data from over 2,500 transphenoidal patients, of which nearly 1,700 were adenoma patients, who I'm gonna focus on here. And so we started by asking uh, a series of questions. And so the first was hyponatremia. And this came up because in, uh, in my institution where I trained at Mass General, we were giving all of the post-op patients slips to check their sodium uh, when they went home. My endocrinologist at UCSF did not do that. And so I said, you know, what, how can we sort of split the gap here where we're, you know, at least identifying and reducing uh, the risk of post-operative um, hyponatremia. And so we studied this and we found, as others have, that there's sort of a, a peak early incidence of hyponatremia on postoperative day two, which you sometimes catch before patients go home. Um, but then there's a, a smaller delayed peak on postoperative day seven. Um, and about 20% of these patients who have hyponatremia will be symptomatic. Most of the symptomatic patients show up in the delayed peak. Symptoms will be dizziness and nausea, vomiting, but a number of them will present with interestingly, headache and blurry vision. So a, a common sort of uh, interrogative question for my uh, junior residents or medical students in the operating room will be if this patient, you know, calls you in two or three days with blurry vision and a headache, what are you going to do? And of course, the CT is the important reflexive answer, but the sodium check comes right after that. Um, and there's a high readmission rate for postoperative hyponatremia, which we've worked to reduce, and we've actually gotten it so this is the initial series that we published at the interim analysis of 13%, but we just checked it recently and it is down to 3% through some proactive measures, which I'll tell you about. And, and so the question that we started out with was, you know, what predicts which patients develop postoperative hyponatremia? Because I was having a hard time convincing my endocrinologist to sort of do the Boston practice of, of giving everyone an outpatient sodium check. And so it turned out that this risk was particularly elevated when the patients started out with preoperative hypopituitarism. And, um, and particularly, uh, the th uh, axes that were predictive of this were hypoadrenalism, hypogonadism, and hypothyroidism. Um, and so simply by getting uh, prioritizing outpatient sodium checks in this cohort, as well as the patients who leave um, the hospital with a sodium of 130 of, uh, on the lower half of normal, we've been able to implement outpatient sodium checks in a sort of a targeted and, and uh, efficient manner, um, and in doing so have reduced our readmission rate effectively. The second question we looked at was 
how effective are the corrective measures that we implement um, in terms of rates of serum sodium correction. And it turned out that um, really none of the things we were doing were any faster than doing nothing. Of course, there's a retrospective bias in terms of which patients are getting which measures. But one measure that we do use for patients with severe hyponatremia, which is effective in its rate of correction, is the ADH antagonist Tovapden or Vaprazole, which we've used in selective cases um, probably about one to two times a year. Um, but it can be very effective uh, when used selectively. Of course, you don't want to correct too fast, um, but it's um, uh, effective at uh, reducing the duration of the severe cases. We then flipped the switch and looked at the DI, sort of the, the yin to the yang of hyponatremia, um, and found that at some level it occurred after about 10% of operations, but um, only about a third of those were permanent in nature um, and was needed in about half of the time when it occurred. The other half of the time patients were able to keep up or drink to thirst. Um, we looked at a huge litany of variables in terms of what's predictive, but to cut to the chase, the three that stood out were younger age, intraoperative CSF leak and, and the pathology of Rathke's or craniopharyngioma. And this really is consistent with others such, such as what Marty Weiss and other series have published. Um, we looked at whether it interacted with hyponatremia and interestingly, it didn't for um, patients with uh, gen in general with postoperative hyponatremia, but delayed hyponatremia, um, about a fourth of those patients went on to have delayed DI. Um, and if you track these serum sodiums over time, you do see that patients with DI have this slightly lower sodium before they present um, with uh, a sodium that may tend to be a little elevated in the setting of being unable to keep up with their thirst. Um, and that could be potentially consistent with the second phase of a classic triphasic DI pattern. Um, the, the, the last thing we looked at sort of hormonally for these patients um, and which was getting at that question that was being asked in the clinic was, how common are new endocrine deficits? And there's a number of caveats to any sort of retrospective uh, inquiry, but in general, the short answer was that it was below 5%. Um, and I, the caveat, of course, is that um, these patients were getting preoperative cortisol checks, but they weren't getting the sort of nuanced preoperative ACTH stim tests um, that an endocrinologist would certainly do in the postoperative setting if they were determining um, how confident they could be that the patient could stay off of dexamethasone for life versus needing replacement. And so it is to the, the preoperative laboratory evaluation compared to the postoperative laboratory evaluation in the borderline setting um, is definitely not a precise comparison. Uh, but nonetheless, we felt comfortable sort of saying that the, the rates of new deficits for adenoma surgery um, were quite low, um, even when we were being aggressive in the approach as, as I showed you in, in some of the videos. So I wanted to spend the remainder of my time sort of shifting gears and, and uh, nerding it up, if you will, a little bit by talking about defining pituitary tumor biology in the lab. Um, my chair when I was in residency, Bob Martuza, I remember once gave a grand rounds at MGH about vestibular schwannomas. And he said, you know, as a scientist, my, my goal is to put the surgeon side of me out of business, so to speak. And, and I took that to heart. And Particularly, you know, a large portion of my research effort is on malignant brain tumors such as glioblastoma, where we really um, have, have not made the kinds of strides that can sort of reduce the need for surgery. But in some ways, benign diseases like vestibular schwannomas or pituitary adenomas um, are understudied but could represent an interesting ground for uh, medical breakthroughs. Um, we've seen to some degree how preoperative somatostatin analogs can make surgery for acromegalax go more favorably by shrinking tumors. And the question is, is there is sort of an equivalent for other types of pituitary adenomas? And those are some of the questions we've tried to address in the lab. Um, and sort of in thinking about this bigger, you know, I have two categories of questions. One is molecular etiology and the other is biomarkers. And so the molecular etiology questions are what causes adenomas molecularly? What drives their growth molecularly? And you know, could identifying these pathways lead to the targeted therapies that could either, you know, eliminate the need for surgery, as we sometimes see with dopamine agonists, or um, become a friend for um, uh, surgeons by, re by cytoreducing tumors uh, before we go to the OR. And then the second category of questions I I'd like to ask is, is, is biomarker questions. I mean, these days, if you, if you bonk your head, you're, you've got a one in six chance of being told you have a pituitary adenoma incidentally. And it's created a large cohort of patients who are running around 
uh, with unclear prognoses. And so the question is, are there um, hematologic or radiographic biomarkers at the time of diagnosis that could predict which small adenomas are likely to grow? And for the purposes of this talk, I won't get into the imaging, but I'll focus on the blood. And similarly, are there blood and biomarkers that we could actually follow over time and, and use them to predict um, at, at a point in time when growth might become eminent? Um, and so in thinking about this molecularly, we want to be able to answer um, two questions when we think about pituitary adenomas. The first is, why is it that some adenomas are, are really giant when they present and others are small and remain small? And there's sort of a variety of possibilities. One is that every adenoma may start out as, they may start out as two different things. Some of them may start out as non-giant and the giant may have been destined to become giant from the beginning with, due to different biology. Some, the giant may just result from longer incubation periods, patients who um, either don't have access to care or just present in a delayed manner. And then the giant may have been non-giant to start with, but may have sustained a second hit. Um, and then the other question we have to ask is, what about the molecular changes in an adenoma activates the growth, but does so in a sort of slow, non-malignant manner that preserves contact-dependent inhibition of growth? Because we certainly see in a in plastic and in a culture, you can grow normal adenoma, normal gland cells, but they they're sparse. They don't. And then if you grow an adenoma, they they grow, but they don't really fill up a sheet of cells the way a malignant cancer would, because they have this preserved contact dependent inhibition of growth. So this has been very challenging for adenomas because there are uh, dozens of you know, changes, mutations, etc., that have been identified, but nothing to date has been ubiquitous in nature. Um, and this is just a drawing from one of our reviews showing how it really varies depending on cell type, but even within individual cell types, there's nothing common. Uh, a bulk sequencing study from Ian Dunn when he was at the Brigham did reveal arm level losses of chromosomes in non-functional pituitary adenomas compared to point mutations in functional adenomas. And, and this has born, been borne out by other stories, but none of these changes are ubiquitous. And you know, one of the questions we asked is, could there be some intratumoral heterogeneity to explain this? Um, and so we really used a modern technique of single cell sequencing to try to look at this. And, and sure enough, when you do single cell sequencing in non-functional pituitary adenomas, you see that the, the, the chromosomal loss changes that Ian and his group identified, we see them, but we see them in a clonal manner. And so each individual non-functional case will have anywhere from three to 10 clones. Some of them show up in every clone and are what we call early changes. Some of them show up in some clones and are what we call late changes. Um, and there is some patterns from case to case, but not a lot. Um, and so we found ourselves sort of pausing for a second and saying, you know, is there a different way of looking at this? And in, in the GBM world, we've, we've done some of this through site-directed biopsies. And so one of the things we were fortunate to do more recently in pituitary adenomas is look at regional variation. And so to do this, the samples I showed you were the classic sort of, if, if I'm taking a patient to the OR and someone from the lab comes, I'm just gonna hand them some tissue, most likely shortly after I open the dura from what we would call the center or the core of the tumor. Uh, but if I, and when we do that, we find most of that sample, we analyzed over 7,000 cells from these cores. And it's what I just described. It's these clones of tumor cells that have chromosomal loss across the board. All of them have chromosomal loss. About 10% of the cells are normal cells, not normal gland, but endothelium, macrophages, sort of interesting stuff that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but that's the pattern. But I, um, I changed it up a couple of times when um, I was managed to sample adenoma cells from what we would call the edge of the tumor. Um, this can be just under the pseudocapsule if you're doing a sort of a pseudocapsular dissection or for a bigger adenoma, this is something where you're chasing out maybe along the cavernous sinus wall or a pie along the diaphragm. But the true sort of edge um, where, you know, there's really nothing beyond this uh, other than uh, where this is the, the last bit of adenoma. And when you do that, we analyzed about 5,000 cells from the tumor edge. We found far fewer tumor cells and, and more normal cells, but again, not normal gland. These are normal cells incorporated into the tumor, mostly immune cells. Um, but interestingly, that, that those tumor cells that we see, they truly are tumor cells based on their transcriptomic profile, but they now lack all of that chromosomal copy number variations that we were seeing in the core. 
Instead, they have increased expression of what we would call stem-like genes, genes that promote quiescence, so they're not proliferating. They're very good at DNA repair, which might explain why they're not dropping chromosomes left and right. And um, they're actually very good at long-term survival, which the cells in the core are not good at. So they have the sort of apoptosis resistance genes. Um, and so to summarize what we saw in sort of 13 samples across 10 patients, um, patterns of chromosomal loss in chromosomes two or 15, potentially representing early events, chromosome 19, potentially representing a later event. And there's a few candidate genes on those things, but more intriguingly moving forward is these sort of tumor cells at the edge that lacked copy number variations, but were expressing genes mediating quiescence, DNA repair, resistance, to apoptosis, and even these ATP binding cassette transporters that are used to pump out bad things and toxins and, and keep um, cells alive. And moving forward, we're trying to see if, if these this cell population aligns with what other groups have seen in the so-called pituitary adenoma stem cell and whether we can uh, isolate these and, 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 and we certainly can using this technique and whether they can be screened via drug screens for small molecule inhibitors and whether that might be sort of a, a path forward for non-functional pituitary adenomas. Of course, that transcriptomic profile, as I said, was very useful because it didn't just identify all the stuff I talked about, but it showed these clusters uh, using these Tisney plots. And you see the normal cells I mentioned to you, some of them are neuronal, some of them are fibroblasts and, and macrophages were very common. And even the tumor cells fell into these, what we call functional categories. Some of them were very proliferative. Some of them interacted with extracellular matrix and some of them helped lay down blood vessels. And so this was an area of ongoing research in the lab um, that I won't uh, dwell on too much. Um, but it uh, was certainly of interest to us um, as we move forward, thinking about what's making these cells proliferate. Shifting gears for a moment, as I mentioned, our work did not really, consistent with other work, really didn't reveal any point mutations of, of interest in the adenomas. But we shifted gears and asked, what about polymorphisms? Because I, I, I did mention we wanted some way of saying, you know, if somebody comes into the clinic with a nine millimeter adenoma that was found because they, you know, hit their head, you know, how do we, is there any way of risk stratifying people who, whose tumors might grow versus not grow? And so we asked, is there polymorphisms, things that you're born with, uh, gen low, genetic loci variation? And we sequenced patient and tumor blood for a whole panel of nearly two dozen common polymorphisms. And we found that a uh, proline to arginine change at codon 72 in the P53 gene arising from a G allele becoming a C allele was occurring in pituitary adenoma patients, um, not just uh, non-functional adenomas, but functional adenomas as well, far in excess of the expected frequency in the population um, with a probability of below 10 to the negative, P value of 10 below 10 to the negative seventh. This polymorphism has been linked to other cancers such as ovarian cancer and colorectal cancer, but to nowhere near the extent we saw in adenomas. And if you extrapolate from some of the population databases. In the general population without the polymorphism, the lifetime risk of developing a pituitary adenoma needing surgery can be calculated using some of the mathematical models. And when you have this G allele polymorphism, your lifetime risk of, of needing surgery from an adenoma goes up by about two and a half fold. Um, and so moving forward, we're trying to validate this prospectively um, in, uh, because it turns out that when you have an adenoma and you come to clinic, you're certainly gonna get a blood draw to to check your hormones, just to document a baseline. And so it's a pretty easy time to, to check for polymorphism. And, and we went on to validate biologically that if you have the, the arginine uh, 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 in that amino acid instead of the proline, your adenoma cells are much more proliferative in culture, uh, which could explain uh, why that phenotype arises. I mentioned um, that the, the last little bit here, but that the Macrophages were the most common sort of normal cell that we saw when we sequenced pituitary adenomas. And we didn't really just want to sit on this observation because in malignant cancers, macrophages are really an important part of the dynamic interplay between cancer cells and their microenvironment. There's good macrophages, which are anti-tumoral or M1. There's bad macrophages, which are M2 or pro-tumoral. And we looked at this and it, it turns out that as tumor um, adenoma, as pituitary adenomas grow and become larger, um, they have more macrophages as seen by CD11B flow. These are bone marrow derived. They're not microglia um, based on their markers. We also looked at uh, another interesting finding though, is that 
paradoxically, as the tumors got bigger, their expression of monocyte chemotactic protein was dropping, not just in the, in the tumor, but in the actual circulation of these patients as well. Um, and as the tumors got bigger, the, uh, the macrophages were becoming more anti-tumoral. And it was really early on that they had this pro-tumoral phenotype. We confirmed that the pro-tumoral macrophages drove tumor proliferation and invasion and, and adenoma cells. And the mediators we identified were EZH2 and um, for the uh, for the uh, invade proliferation, and we found that the M2 macrophages were more associated with cavernous sinus invasion. And so when we wrapped it all together, we have this hypothesis that these adenomas had an initial growing phase where they were very reliant on M2 protumoral macrophages and, and the MCP1 and the EZH2, as well as another mediator S189. But they do later on enter a quiescent phase where they interact more favorably with the macrophages in, in, in a way that sort of restricts growth more. And it was the idea was to sort of identify this early window of intervention um, before they break out into this quies, quiescent phase. And we're trying to look at the circulating levels of some of these chemokines like MCP1 as a way of predicting which tumors um, may be in a growing phase when intervention may be indicated. So in conclusion, I hope I've given you some sense of what we've all seen these days that endoscopic endonasal surgery provides us access beyond the cella to the cavernous sinus and the supracellar cistern. A number of future directions that we and others are looking at is just imaging predictors of texture. Um, as well as the possibility of doing staged approaches for more anterior tumors. The um, endocrine morbidities, they do tend to interact with each other. I showed you examples of delayed hyponatremia, potentially increasing your risk for delayed DI, preoperative hypopituitarism, potentially in uh, increasing the risk for postoperative uh, hyponatremia. And then in the lab, just some of the stuff we've looked at with how complex pituitary adenoma biology can be for a benign tumor the possibility that there may be a lateralized quiescent stem-like population uh, with some long-term durability that may be a source of recurrence or, or um, just generating tumors. And the distal cells that evolve, they, they tend to have loss of chromosomes and, and exhibit a more high turnover than the lateralized population. And then there are some variability from patient to patient in, that in terms of circulating biomarkers such as genetic polymorphisms or even circulating cytokines that may be very useful as ways of um, predicting future growth uh, for pituitary adenoma patients. And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, my neurosurgical colleagues, Louis Blevins and endocrinology, Sandy Kunwar for neurosurgery. Um, the ENT team was instrumental for the uh, endonasal endoscopic approaches, our neurosurgery residents, postdocs in the lab, and the numerous medical students over the years who've, who've made all this work possible. I wanted to um, stop in time to leave questions and for any questions I don't get to, I'm happy to take any by email and chat any time. Anish, hey, it's uh, Ted Schwartz, how are you? Good, how are you, Ted? I'm good, that was really wonderful. Um, thanks for that great talk for all our residents. I had just a couple comments and, and questions. Um, first of all, the, you know, the, um, the meningioma resectability scale, I just wanted to mention that the, the guy who wrote that paper was is named Brett Youngerman, who actually is an attending at Columbia. So this is a combined Cornell-Columbia uh, Grand Rounds, and that was a combined Cornell-Columbia project. And I just wanted to give Brett a shout out because of all the great work he did on that. Um, but you know, as you know, those cases are really all about case selection. You know, which is why we wrote what, what we wrote and you guys wrote what you wrote and, and making sure you choose the right cases to make sure you get a good outcome. Um, your pituitary work with post-op endocrine dysfunction is so um, sort of seminal. I just also wanted to, you know, let people sort of appreciate that, that enormous series that you published um, looking at post-op hypopituitarism is really just a classic paper. And I've never even tried to publish a paper on that subject because I thought yours was so good that I wouldn't do as good a job. So I just wanted to congratulate you on that work. Um, and then on the post-op um, uh, hyponatremia, um, I, I wasn't sure you mentioned it explicitly, but are you um, fluid restricting your patients when they go home for a couple of days to prevent that from happening? Or are you just doing sodium checks? Because we started fluid restricting our, 
patients, which is something that Ed Laws had, had done a little study on and seemed to work very well. And that reduced our rate of post-op hyponatremia, that post that day six, day seven uh, dip. And I was wondering if you'd tried that and if it worked for you. And then the last thing that we started doing for some of our patients was to um, put them on omega-3 fatty acids. There were some studies out of the ENT literature that showed that post-op uh, decreases in olfaction, hyposmia were less, and they did a randomized study of this. So we started putting all our patients on, on omega-3s for a few months. Thanks, Ted, um, for great questions. And yeah, definitely shout out to Brett and really cool that that paper was collaborative. I did notice that uh, on the author list. Um, regarding, and, and I should mention on, in terms of the endocrine thing, just for the residents out there, that was something that, you know, when I, when I started, you just sort of, and I probably mentioned this in the talk, but sort of find your lane or find a gap and, and sort of claim it. It's um, even in a, in a world like ours, there's always something you can do to, um, you know, put your flag up and, and, and that leads to interest in your work. So thanks for that. Regarding hyponatremia, we are um, purely at the moment doing targeted um, uh, outpatient checks and, and it's been successful in, in reducing our rate. We were aware of um, the work in, that you and Ed have and we um, have had recent discussions about implementing that. In fact, um, we have the, the picture online uh, and, and potentially ready to go. Um, so I, I anticipate that happening. Um, I think everybody was on board with doing it. Um, and um, uh, I, I, we, but yeah, we have like this UCSF picture that we're gonna likely be giving our, our folks soon. Um, and just as a me method of further reducing it, but certainly um, publishing those results, it was nice to see that you had good compliance and, and Ed, that, um, and that it was very doable. So we're looking forward to that. We haven't tried omega-3, but I'm definitely looking for something for that. Um, and uh, I think that would be really cool. So we'll definitely try that. Thanks for the suggestion. All right, great, thanks again. Hi, I'm Anisha Smithian. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I also have a brief comment and a question. I agree with both of you about the relevance of um, monitoring uh, uh, putting people on fluid restriction. We also um, have an ERAS program, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program, where the patient and the nurse are on a portal and they, uh, you know, exchange data. We send the patients with a picture to, to collect their urine and tell us their ins and outs. And uh, we restrict them if, they, if their sodium is less than 130. And we have actually in the last year have not had a single readmission for hyponatremia. But uh, my question, I was intrigued by your uh, single cell data. And I was curious, where did those pituitary stem cells um, locate on that T-SNE plot? And also you mentioned that there may be adenoma stem cells. And I was wondering if you thought they could be normal pituitary stem cells. So yeah, I, I would say that uh, a lot of caution with terminology because it, it remains to be proven. They do transcriptomically resemble um, the adenoma is more than normal gland, but you're absolutely right that it would take a deeper dive to tease out sort of uh, much like a neural stem cell versus a, a GBM stem cell. Like it, it's a little more nuanced. And so we're early in the process of teasing that out. Um, when we put them on the Tisney plot, they have sort of their own cluster that, um, uh, you know, has some uh, distinction uh, and not a lot of overlap with sort of um, uh, what we're seeing in the more, um, the, in the adenoma cells that have chromosomal loss. You know, um, that's interesting. I wanted to say one of the difficulties with this is the absence of normal tissue. Um, but in the last year or two, and I mentioned this for anyone interested, we've had good luck um, with our medical donation program, actually um, taking pituitary uh, gland and doing single cell and even obtaining live cells on so-called warm autopsy samples. Um, yeah, we were even able to sort for specific receptors, just sort of, it was very helpful to have the normal uh, to compare to. But thanks again. Thank you. Thanks so much, Manish. It's really great to see both sides, both the clinical and the basic science side coming together. Uh, one question I had uh, with regards to the work that you were doing with the P53 polymorphisms, you were saying that, you know, they were acting more aggressively um, in the lab, 
does that correlate at all with a change in the KI index that you were seeing or anything you were seeing histologically, uh, number one? And then secondarily, uh, with respect to the clonal populations that you were seeing at the core versus the stem-like properties at the periphery, did those differences at all uh, correlate with size of the tumor? So for example, you know, tumors that had grown larger and had been there for longer, uh, you know, were they more likely, for example, to have these you know, stem-like characteristics at the periphery? Uh, yeah, great question. So on the polymorphism, we didn't see a difference in MIB-1. So I think, um, you know, of course, MIB-1 is uh, somewhat limited, you know, in its utility, but yeah, we, de we did not. And then um, regarding uh, the uh, question of the um, stem-like cells, um, the, uh, we, the part of the, ch the, the short answer is we don't know because the sample size is just too small right now. And the other challenge is you can imagine an adenoma where you're getting sort of regional sampling tends to be pretty large. Um, and so it, uh, I think the, the, the cases we're collecting on tend to be within a size range that's fairly large in nature. So it's hard to know for sure what the size correlation would be. Sure, thanks. Manish, it's Rohan, great talk. Um, question for you, you briefly alluded to this, but you know, there's been a recent repopularization of the idea of uh, the, resecting the media wall of a cavern of science, looking at Juan's work at, uh, in Stanford. I'm curious your thoughts on it. I mean, my, my view of it is, and what I've been doing more recently is I'll really inspect the medial wall, see if it looks at all invaded and then consider removing it. But it seems for those, those cases that go through the dura might be worth it, but I'm just curious what your, how you guys have approached it versus, you know, is that a case that you check biochemically and then refer for radiosurgery? Yeah, we, we haven't been doing it sort of reflexively by any means. Um, obviously sometimes it happens as part of the approach if you're going through a pre-existing defect. Um, I think on a hormonally active microadenoma or any adenoma, we've been doing more direct inspection. I mean, but it's an interesting question. There are certainly occasional cases of Cushing's in particular where a microadenoma that abuts the wall and you, you feel like you get it all and, and you know, there's either delayed biochemical remission or a less than optimal remission. And I do find myself wondering on those, would those have been... But the question is, that, you know, to proactively do that without having that data, I, I think, at least from my end, it seems a little much. I mean, I, I'm sure others would feel differently, but um, we haven't quite reached that point where we're doing it reflexively. Okay, great. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad the time difference works in your favor for our virtual session, but we certainly hope that we can have you join us in New York uh, sometime soon. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. Great talk. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Manish. So Manish, um, we can stay on for, feel free to take a break and then maybe we'll regroup.